Well, hey, good morning. Good morning. I uh, want to go ahead and just make a couple of announcements, although I don't have a bulletin, so I'm going to run this one from memory. Uh, announcement one is we will be having a baby shower for Lisa Hill, so uh, if you've signed up and all that, head on over after service for, uh, I know there's some good food and all that stuff over there, so uh, if you signed up, welcome, and, and if you haven't, I'm pretty sure there's a spot for you as well, so uh, you know, it, take care and enjoy that after service. Uh, the other thing I want to announce is that the Women's Choice Network uh, baby bottles campaign that we've been doing, uh, next Sunday we need to collect those and we're going to send those back. So if you've been saving up money for the Women's Choice Network, please uh, bring those baby bottles back sometime this week or just on Sunday and you can drop them off in either my office or that office in the center or just hand it to me, doesn't matter. Um, and then I think that's it for announcements, that uh, there's, everything else is in the bulletin, so I'll let you read that. Would you stand with me? Let's, let's uh, start our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege that it is to come and gather together in the name of Jesus. Lord, we recognize that today uh, in, in our world there's so many things going on. Lord, I think about uh, just seeing the news last night of, of the, the, the issues going on in the Middle East with Israel and Iran, and uh, Lord, we just pray that in your sovereign will that you would bring about the, the things you want to bring about, Lord. We pray for peace. We pray that, uh, God, that, that somehow you can, can work all this together for the good of those that love you. Uh, Lord, we pray that um, you would just give wisdom to, to all the leaders to make sure that, God, your purposes are accomplished. Uh, Father, we thank you that we live in a country where we have freedom to gather, where we're protected and safe to be able to do this and to gather in Jesus' name. And God, now I just pray that you would, you would just show up here among us, Lord, and that you would fill our hearts and fill our minds and fill our souls and just, 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 just be so very close to us this morning. Uh, as we just sing to you, Lord, I pray that we would sing loud, pleasing worship to you, that we would just declare your goodness this morning, because Lord, you are that. You are good, you are kind, you are awesome. And Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of, of your word and the listening of your word, and that God, in all things, all that we do this morning would be worship to you, and you would find it as pleasing in your sight. We pray this all in the name, the power, the authority of our great God and King. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul. Him for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who so wondrously reigneth, shelters the under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how all thy longings have been granted? to the Lord. 
God who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Pardon anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he be to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that have life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again, gladly forever. King of heaven, with a battle 
Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus, surrender only at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender Praise the Lord. Be seated, my friends. Let's continue our, our worship through prayer. We're going to do a prayer for the congregation. We'll pray over the offering, and then after that's done, the, the offering will we'll pass out the offering. If you're a first-time guest, just want to let you know that uh, there's no obligation to give. We're just your attendance here with us is a blessing enough. So, uh, would you just bow your heads with me? Let's let's pray to the Lord together. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for. Again, just the fact that we're, we're here assembled as, as one body, the church. And God, I just pray blessings over this entire congregation. I pray that, God, you would work in each one of our hearts to draw us closer to you. 
to bring us higher up into our sanctification, to bring us deeper in love with you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would empower us to go out and to share the gospel. I pray, Lord, that uh, for those of us that are dealing with, with health issues this morning, uh, Lord, I just pray that you would reach down from heaven and touch with your healing hand and just remove the, the infirmities that, that are in our bodies, Lord. Uh, Father, we know that in the world to come there will be no sickness and no death, and we just ask that even now there would be an inbreak of the kingdom that is to come, and that we would experience it now, Lord, even as we wait for the fullness of it to come in the future. Father, I pray for those, uh, Lord, as we get ready to take the offering, we just pray that the offering would be, uh, that these financial gifts would be used rightly, that they would be used to further your kingdom. Uh, and God, I just pray that uh, you give us wisdom as a board and, uh, and all of that just as, as terms of uh, managing these funds. And we pray that ultimately this money would go to, to good causes, to, to just further the name, the glory of Jesus Christ here on earth. And, and Father, I pray for those that are unable to give, Lord, that you would bless their financial situation so that they may be able to give one day. Father, I pray that, that you would just uh, be at work in our hearts as we just, just continue just to sit under the weight of the word. God, we just pray that you would move in this time. We just pray your blessing on our congregation. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Ushers can come forward. Let's pray over the, uh, the preaching of the Word, and then we'll get into our message. Heavenly Father, it's our prayer this morning to see Jesus in this text, to see the glorious realities of salvation, your sovereignty to, to save those uh, whom you will. And Lord, we just pray that, God, you would just reveal these, these deep truths to us uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the revealed Word of God. I just pray, God, that you would move in this time. God, I can do nothing apart from you, so I just pray blessing on my preaching. Uh, and Lord, we can't even hear you rightly without your blessing. And so I just pray blessing on the listening of the word. But I also pray that, that we would not just listen to the word, but that we would become doers of the word. And so, Father, I just pray that, that this word would be effective, that it would cause heart change and life change. And we pray this all in the name, the power, the authority of our great God and King in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, uh, if I could describe the theme of the week, week for me uh, this week would be the word incomplete. Uh, I've been dealing with a couple incomplete things, and uh, one of the things that uh, I've been dealing with recently that's incomplete, for some of you, you might know, uh, Mikkel and I recently got our house, and so we're getting ourselves kind of well, I'm getting myself moved in. She doesn't get to move in for another 48 days, but uh, we're starting to get ourselves ready. And what we're finding out is that uh, the, the flipper, I think that's who sold us a house, the flipper did some good work, but he did a lot of, or they did, I don't know, a lot of incomplete work, work that's just not quite finished. And so a good example of that is when we got the house, uh, we, there's, there's carpet in the basement, and we said, oh, this would be a great activity room for the kids or something. And you, know, you kind of assume that, you know, there's carpet. Obviously, they've taken steps to waterproof this basement and everything like that. And I don't know if you've heard this. Um, you got to be like, you know, have you heard it's raining in Pittsburgh recently? Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we, I was not at the house Friday, and obviously there were some flash floods Thursday and Friday. So Saturday, Mikkel and I met at the house to paint, and, uh, and so I got there early, and I was just kind of walking around the house, and I said, I wonder how the basement's looking. And I know that there was a little bit of leakage on the other side of the basement, but I took one step down, and I just heard squish, 
and every part of the carpet was soaked. I mean, it was just, so that put a pause on our painting, and I, got a, I had to go, I am frequent flyer at Home Depot now. Uh, if you thought you saw me there, I, I am. Uh, had to go get a utility knife. As a renter, that shows you how little I did as a renter, that I did not own a utility knife until yesterday, okay? But uh, I had to cut up carpet and do all that. But here's the thing. They, they did a great job laying down the carpet. It looked good. It was nice. But they did an incomplete job. As nice as they did laying some carpet down, if you don't do the work of waterproofing the basement, then that work, really, it's just incomplete, and it's not the best. It's, there's problems going on there. And, uh, and maybe you've experienced that. Maybe if you're a homeowner, you know exactly what that's like. If you're a renter, like I used to be, you know, I'll call a landlord and he'll fix this for me. Uh, but that's, that's incomplete work. Uh, maybe you have a coworker at your job that does a lot of incomplete work, and you're the one always having to fix their incomplete work. Or maybe you're the one doing the incomplete work, which is, here's your sign to, to work unto the Lord. But the reason I say that this has been the theme of the week is even this text this morning. We're going to be reading Jonah's prayer in Jonah chapter 2. It's in page, uh, I think it's 821 of your pew Bible. So you can go ahead and grab that. We're going to be reading Jonah's prayer this morning. But here's the, the thing. I don't know how to say this, but Jonah's prayer is a little bit incomplete. There's some things in his prayer Everything he says is right and good, but there's things that he hasn't said that are significant, that we need to pay, pay attention to. So uh, in case you missed it, last week we were in Jonah chapter 1. What happens is Jonah gets a call from God to go to Nineveh and to preach, tell the people, the city, Nineveh, capital of Assyria, it's going to be destroyed. Uh, and Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, goes the other way. Uh, he goes to Tarshish which is like 2,500 miles in the wrong direction because he does not want to fulfill God's command because he knows that God, when he preaches, hey, I'm going to destroy this city, God also will offer a chance for repentance. And he does not want to see Nineveh, which was the enemy of Israel this day, uh, the the capital city of, of, of Assyria. He didn't want to see them be forgiven. And so we had talked about how, unfortunately, for us at times, God loves the people even we don't love. God wants to see the people we cannot stand be forgiven and be brought into right relationship. And so we talked about how Jonah, he tries to avoid it. He tries to get on the ship, but then eventually God causes a storm, and then uh, he gets singled out. He gets thrown over, uh, overboard into the sea. And we left off the story with uh, the sailors who were Gentiles, that means non-Jews, the Gentile sailors, they're making sacrifices and vows to God. They, have, uh, they have, have a right relationship with God, it appears. And we left the story off with Jonah just being thrown into the sea. And we'll pick it up now in chapter 1, verse 17, where it says this, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, that word appointed is going to come up multiple times in this story. Uh, It's the idea here that the Lord is able to sovereignly bring about the things he wants to bring about when he wants to bring them about. He is able to to say, look, I'm going to have this fish swallow this person at this time and in this place. And he's able to do that and no one can stop him. What he wants to happen will happen. Uh, And so there's nothing, a lot of times we say, it's Jonah and the whale. Uh, the text doesn't really make that clear. It just says fish. In the Jewish people were not a seafaring people, so they, they, anything in the water was a fish. Big fish, small fish, just it's all fish to them. Uh, it could have been a whale. We're not quite sure. But what I want to stress is that the Lord appointed for this fish. This was not an accident, all oh, happenstance, by chance. No, God is sovereign. God is able to do exactly what he wants to accomplish. And so God is able to take a, a fish that he might have been swimming, doing his own thing, and the Lord is able to bring that fish exactly where he wants. Because he is, when I say sovereign, what I mean is he is the supreme ruler of the universe. No one gets to uh, uh, tell God no. No one gets to say, no, actually, I think it should be this way. What God wants, God gets. That's what it means to be sovereign. He does whatever he pleases, and no one can talk back to him. And so 
Jonah finds himself, he, without God's intervention, Jonah would have died. He's in the sea. He's been thrown overboard. Not that great of a swimmer, I imagine, to be able to swim back to land from the sea. And yet the Lord in his sovereignty and in his grace appoints a fish to save Jonah. While Jonah is in the middle of his disobedience, in the middle of his refusal to obey God's call, God appoints a fish in grace to save Jonah. And and I want to say it's you and me. None of us were looking for God to save us when God put that call out for us. When he he started to reach out first. And and in our cases, uh, the Lord did not probably appoint a fish to bring about your salvation. He probably appointed a church, members in that church, someone that shared the gospel with you. Uh, All of that was not on accident. Uh, I talk about, I remember uh, I was a a young boy. I was sitting in the back of my parents' Durango, and my brother, uh, of all people, he said, I I know one day I'm going to be with Jesus when I die. And I said, how can you be so sure? He said, at VBS tonight, I prayed to receive the Lord. And I said, well, I want to do that. And I prayed in the back of this silver Durango uh, to receive Jesus. I think that was an appointment from the Lord. The Lord used that. That was not an accident. And then I could trace my entire life where the right people came in at the right time, and the Lord just sovereignly guided my life to bring me here. And I imagine if you look at your life, you will see that the right time, the right people, and the right way have come about to bring you here, for you to be right here. Again, you're not here because you, from the depths of your soul, wanted to be here. It's because God drew you here. He put the call out. He brought you here. And so we see God's sovereignty here as he appoints this fish. And what I want to say is now we're about to get to Jonah chapter 2. And this is the first time in all of Jonah that we actually see Jonah pray. Now that's pretty significant. I mean, here Jonah's a prophet. And it takes him a whole chapter before he finally starts to pray. We see that in Jonah chapter 1, he was asked to pray, but there's no indication that he did. What we find out, this is really weird, but we have this idea that all the prophets in the Bible are good people. They do everything right. They're just morally, I mean, sure, they might have a little bit of sin, but but they're really, they're they're the elite of the elite. But what I want to say is actually, no, Jonah is an example of someone that, Not only does he struggle with sin, we see him losing to sin often. He's not perfect. He has made mistakes. And what I want to just say to you is that's true even of Christian leaders today and of pastors today. Uh, I remember when I became a a pastor, I don't know what I thought was going to happen. I thought like the Lord was just going to sprinkle some pastor dust on me and I was just going to be like perfect. You know, I was just going to float through life, never getting mad, always being... That's not happened. Uh, Not at all. (laughs) In fact, there's been more situations that have tested my patience. Uh, And I want to assure you, whatever Christian hero, leader you look up to, even good ones, you know, you're talking John Piper, John MacArthur, Tim Keller, Francis Chan, every pastor, every Christian leader struggles with the same sins and temptations that you do. If you followed me around for a week, you'll find out I struggle with the same things you struggle with. Uh, yeah, I got the same people cutting me off on 28 North that cut you off on 28 North. And I got to resist temptations to say words there, you know. And, and that's, that's because none of us in this life become wholly sanctified, that we become completely perfect. Every one of us will have to struggle with our sin to the day we die. Now, our hope and our prayer is that the Lord would sanctify us every day, that we would grow in holiness, that we would look back over 20 years and say, wow, Lord, look how far you have brought me. Not I, but what you have done through me. But Jonah, a great example of Christian leaders being flawed men. And uh, so we finally get to Jonah's prayer here. Like I said, I'm going to not disagree with anything Jonah says, but I will disagree with what he doesn't say. So let's start here. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. Uh, Sheol is the land of the dead. Um, Today, we usually think of when you die, if you're uh, not a believer, you go to hell. If you are a believer, you go to heaven. 
Before the coming of Jesus, that's not how afterlife locations worked, I guess you could say. A Sheol is a place that everyone went to. It's just generically the land of the dead. Uh, what we know is in Sheol, there was one side where people would be in torment, what you might think of as, as hell. And then there's other side called the bosom of Abraham, where righteous souls that, that did not have yet received Jesus' blood and death at the cross. So they were just in this sort of kind of heaven, but not heaven, because God's not fully there in the same way. Uh, It's just called the land of the dead. In fact, whenever we do the Apostles' Creed and we say he descended to the dead, literally to Sheol. You might have heard some translations say he descended to hell, but there's some wrong connotations with that. Sheol is more complicated. It's not just torment. Uh, Sheol could be uh, torment on one side and then uh, this land of not torment on the other side. But the question that we have here why does Jonah say he's in Sheol? Because we know he's in the ocean. He's in the sea. So why is he saying Sheol? Well, the Bible has a different version of the, cos- the cosmos. Uh, they have a three-tiered cosmology. What that means, the Bible talks about it like this. There's heaven up here. There is the earth here. And then there's the land of the dead, Sheol, underneath here. And the thought was that the earth sat on these columns, these like columns of rock, and underneath those columns, that's where Sheol is. Now, I know someone might say, that's not really true. That's, that's, there's hot magma underneath the ground here, and, and that's space up there. That's not heaven. And I want to say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's, that's true. But the Bible is giving you these pictures of trying to describe something even more true. Like, for example, in 48 days, Mikkel and I are going to be standing right here, and I might say to Mikkel, I love you from the bottom of my heart. And if someone says, actually, uh, you don't love from a heart, that's just a muscle that pumps blood. Uh, you really love, there's neurons in your brain that fire, and that, that's where you love people from. I'm going to say, sit down. What are you talking about? Like, that's not, you're, you're describing something more than true when you're talking about uh, things like this. And I think one of the pictures, when we talk about heaven being up there, today's a beautiful day. I recommend everyone take a walk today and stand out in the sun, look at the sun, and just let the, that warm sun just, just wash over you. And I want you to close your eyes, just feel that warmth, feel that just the light. And I want to say that's just a drop of what heaven would be like. But then to think about if you've ever dug a hole and you've taken out dirt, and there's this cold, lifeless, gross, dirty hole, and you put your hand on, you feel how cold it is. The Bible will say that's death. That's what death feels like. And so it's giving you a picture, something more true than just, okay, spatial whatever. There's a picture here of heaven's up here because it's warm, and it's good, and it's beautiful, and, and, and this, the dead, they're in the ground, and it's cold and dark and, and not good. And so Jonah's able to say, I was down in Sheol. I was basically in the land of the dead. I was going to die if you didn't do anything. And yet I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol, and you heard my voice. And what this teaches us about God is that God is able to reach down from heaven, through the earth, down into Sheol, and reach and save the ones he loves. He is able, he's not limited. See, ancient gods usually were limited. Maybe they could run around in heaven, but they couldn't come to earth, or they could do some stuff on earth, but they they couldn't go down to the underworld, or the underworld, but they couldn't come up. That's not true of God. Nothing limits God. God is able to, to reach down all the way into Sheol. David says, if I make my bed, if I go up to the highest heaven, you're there. If I go down into Sheol and make my bed, you're there. I can't run away from you, God. God is is able. And so the good news about that, friends, is that if you feel like you're in Sheol, you feel like your life is dead, you feel like I'm far from God, I'm distant from God, God is able to reach out and touch you and save you and bring you back out of Sheol, out of a place of deadness. And so that's what he does with Jonah. He reaches out and he he brings this. And I want to point out that God is not limited by death. Like, he's not afraid to go to the underworld because God is life. Death only exists in his absence. In fact, the Bible talks about death as something that, that uh, it only exists because, because God allows it to exist. And one day, God plans to throw away death. He plans to just 
throw it into the lake of fire, that there will be no more death when he's done with its purpose in this world. And we know that the purpose of death in this world is to limit sin so that we don't stay in our sin forever, but there's a way of punishing and removing sin, which we see at the cross. But, but now we move to verse 3 here. Jonah says this, When you threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the current overcame me, all your breakers and your billows swept over me. Now, Jonah's actually quoting Psalm 42 here. In fact, uh, he's going to quote about 20 different psalms in 10 verses, or reference at least 20 different psalms. And what I want to say is Jonah's absolutely right. Th- these are uh, God's billows and breakers. He is the one sending this storm. He is the one that ultimately caused Jonah to be thrown into the sea. Uh, that's absolutely right. I don't disagree with any of that. But what's interesting is Jonah does not say why he was thrown into the sea. Why billows and breakers are overwhelming him. Because the reason why is he was disobedient. Because he refused God's call. See, what we'll see, if you, you can just skim down that chapter, you will not find one time where Jonah says, I'm sorry, I repent, forgive me, none of that. That's why I say this prayer feels incomplete. There's a level here where there's not a heart change in Jonah. He recognizes that God can save and he's awesome for saving. And yet, Jonah refuses to recognize his role in what's going on. He just says, I, I, you threw me into the sea. I like, yeah, but what, what happened before that? You know how sometimes if you have kids, your kid comes and they tell you just part of the story. You know, my, you know, my, my brother hit me. He said, well, what were you doing before he hit you? Oh, hitting him. Oh, okay. You know, that, that's what Jonah's doing here. He's not taking any credit. He's not apologizing or any of this. And I think one of the things that keeps us from, uh, well, one, I want to just point out, Jonah, like I said, quotes 20 or references 20 psalms in his prayer. He knew scripture. He memorized it. He could quote it from inside a belly of, of a fish. But yet, for all of his study and all of his hearing, he was not a doer of the word. For all of his reading about God's desire to to save the nations through the people of Israel, he refuses to be part of what God wants to do. One of the things that keeps us from being a doer of the word is by having what's called a faulty presupposition. A presupposition is something that you presuppose to be true. Something you assume to be true, you don't even have to argue about it. And, And we have presuppositions all the time. You know, if If you drink water from that water fountain, you presuppose that's clean water, that's filtered water, because you live in America and you know that there's tests that have to be done for for water. We we have many true presuppositions, but sometimes we have untrue ones, and it changes, it affects how we read Scripture. So let me address one of the most common presuppositions that people today have. People today believe that the Bible is a book about you. It's about how to make you better, how to get you better life, how to make you more moral. It's about how to make you a better person, how to make you more likable, how to make you more wealthy, how to make you more healthy. It's about you. And, and what they'll do is they'll read the Bible like it's a book like from Dr. Phil. And it's, it's, this is life tips. This is seven tips to be kinder, five ways to save up, to build your bank account. And if you do that, you, you can get some commands. There's certainly commands in here to follow. There's certainly good you know, you call them tips, really commands, the good laws. But yet, that's a faulty presupposition. Because this book's ultimately not about you. It's about God. The, from beginning to end, there's only one character who keeps coming up over and over and over again. It's not you. It's God. And it's a book about how God loves his people and saves his people. And if you read the Bible wrongly with poor presuppositions, then I'm going to say you're, it's going to be incorrect interpretations, but even then, it'll be soul-crushing. Because you'll read that book, and you'll see all the things you're commanded to do, and say, I can't do it. I can't do all of these things. There's just too much going on, and I want to say, that's not what the book was trying to tell you. The Bible's trying to tell you, trust in the grace of God. Receive His forgiveness, and His salvation, and His mercy. It's about Him. And then you say, oh, Oh, okay, so, so all I have to do is worship. All I have to do is just be obedient and just love him. And, just, and as I love and as I just worship him, 
things just start to unlock in life. Obedience becomes easier when we love God more. But here's some of the presuppositions that I think Jonah had. We'll see them in verses 4 through 7. Here, let's read together. And I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth gates shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. It seems, as many ancient Israelites believed, that Jonah presupposes that God will be faithful to him because he's an Israelite. Because he has a special status uh, as an Israelite, because of the covenant God made to the people of Israel, God will save him. And that's actually true. God, God has a special relationship with the people of Israel that, that he will be f- f- uh, faithful to his covenant here. And he recognizes this, that I could be down in the pit. I could be in Sheol and I cry out to you and you're faithful, you're good, you will save. And that's amen, yes and true. But over and over again, Israel will say, God, are you being faithful to the covenant? Are you being faithful while they themselves are not faithful to the covenant. The promise that God makes, God always keeps his promises. And yet so often Israel failed to keep it. But he presupposes that because, hey, I'm a, I'm a Jewish person, I'm Israelite, I, I can pray at the temple, that God's going to save me because of this. But we also see a presupposition Jonah has about Gentiles. This is verses 8 and 9. It says this, Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, this is, I said last week, Jonah's actually read to be a comedy. Because this is funny here. Because he's saying, yeah, one day I'm going to get out of this this fish, and I'm going to make vows, and I'm going to make sacrifices. But in Jonah chapter 1, we saw that the Gentile sailors that he compares himself to in verse 8, they've already done that. They've already made vows. They've already made sacrifices with God. See, what Jonah presupposes, what he believes to be true, is that because he has this special status with God as an Israelite, that God has no intention of saving or loving anyone else. That's just not the case. Over and over again, we keep seeing the point of God calling and choosing Israel was that so through them, they might be a blessing to the world. And yet, what Jonah supposed was, no, it's because we're so good, that God loves us so much that he chose us. Even though we know in Deuteronomy, God says the opposite. Don't think it's because you're so great that I chose you. Don't think it's because you're so numerous, because you were the least of all nations when I chose you. But I chose you because I loved you and I had purposes and plans for you. And so what, what we see here about God here is that God actually does have plans for those, those, who, those who cherish worthless idols. God actually wants to save them. God actually wants the, to call them to repentance, not to just leave them in their disobedience. He wants to reach out and save them. God is the biggest missionary that you'll ever meet. There's no one who wants to save the world more than God. He is the one authorizing hundreds and thousands of missionaries all over the world, giving them power to be effective where they're at. Because God doesn't just save a a select few just to say, okay, here you go. But he wants to send his people out to share the good news, to spread the gospel farther and wider. And so for Jonah here, he's ignorant of God's sovereignty to save. That God wants to save Jews and Gentiles. He wants to save the whole world. And so Jonah's resisting this call. He's resisting his call to go to Nineveh, to to share, to, to preach a message of repentance there. And what I would say is when you're resisting God's will, you're it's never gonna work out for you. Because God gets what God wants. And uh to quote the great American philosopher Ric Flair, who once said, If you don't like it, learn to love it because it's the best thing going today. God's will, he's going to bring about what he wants. If God wants it to happen, he's going to make it happen. And you can work against him. You can can go against storms and whales. Or you can say, okay, God, here's what you want. 
I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what you want. And, and Jonah, his life is so hard up to this point because he's been disobedient. So here's, here, we're at the end of his prayer, and I just want to say, what can we learn from Jonah's prayer? Well, here's what I would say. We can learn that prayer is a mirror to your soul. If you want to know what you really think about God, look, just, just listen to your own prayers. Your prayers will tell you everything you think about God and yourself. When we look at Jonah's prayer, we look at someone who recognizes how awesome God is, that God can save people, even from the depths of Sheol, and yet we see a kind of hard heart in Jonah, that he refuses to recognize his responsibility, refuses to recognize his sin, his own need for repentance. And so I ask you today, if you recorded your prayer, you, maybe you just listen through, what, what kind of prayers do you pray? Do you pray prayers like Jonah, where, where you, might, you might throw out the right Christian catchphrases? You might quote Psalms. You might, hey, I, I heard that on Word FM or K-Love. That sounds good. I'm going to pray that to that. But we pray Christian words all while we live unchristian lives. And, and, and we don't ever acknowledge our sin, ever acknowledge our need for him in, in a deeper kind of way. I, I want to say that's, that's a very American presupposition. Many Americans think that, that God exists to bless you. God exists to, to just be your tooth fairy, if you will, just to accomplish the goals of the things you give him. You pray for things, and he's supposed to, uh, to, to listen to everything you say, and he's just there to, to make it happen. When you can't make ends meet, he's the magic. And yet that's not who God is. But if you pray like that, I want you to know that's, you might not say that out loud, but that's what your prayer says about God. There's some people in this room, though, I think it might actually be the opposite. Like, I know there's some people that pray like this. They'll say, God, I'm a sinner. Uh, I'm terrible. I'm horrible. Thank you for saving me. Uh, amen. And that's all it is. And I want to say that's also an incomplete prayer. Because, yes, you are a sinner, and you are terrible, and God did save you in spite of your sin. But he didn't just save you just, just so you could just offer that up. He saved you so you could be a son or daughter of the king. So you actually could ask him for things. Like what I mean is I know there are people in this room who will gladly pray for other people. Gladly pray for other people's healing. Gladly pray for other people to be blessed. And yet re refuse to pray for themselves. They feel like, I, I don't know, maybe you, you think, well, God, I've already messed up so much, and I'm really not worthy of anything, so I'm going to just not ask too much. You've already saved me, so thanks for that. But, and, and then what we'll say is, well, this, is, this isn't big enough to ask God. I, and what I want to say is, do you believe that God only can handle the big things? Do you think that the things have to be really huge before you go to him, or can you bring little things to God? Does God care about that little stuff? That's why I love, uh, I worked in children's ministry for years, and I loved taking prayer requests from, from kids because they get it. They get if God is sovereign, if God can bring fish about to put him right in the right place at the right time, if God can do anything he wants, ask him to do everything. Like, if you ask a kid for prayer requests, it's like, my, my dog's paw got hurt. There's a cut there. Okay, all right, we'll pray for that. Uh, my, my grandma's sick. Okay, we'll pray for that. Uh, I skinned my knee. Okay, yeah, we'll pray for that. I mean, prayer, uh, you've got to cut it off at a certain point because they recognize if God's sovereign, if God can do anything and he can do everything, why aren't we praying for it all? Why aren't we putting all of it in front of him? And yet what happens is at some point as an adult, Maybe it's because we, we're in prayer meetings and we don't hear everyone say everything. So we get timid and we think, well, that's not big enough for God. That's, I'll tell you, when we, Mikkel and I were painting yesterday, I said, God, I hope, <laughs> I hope this paint doesn't drip and I hope it looks good. All of that, I think God cares. I think God wants us to bring all of it because here's the thing. When you give him big and small things, what you recognize is God's sovereignty over everything. You recognize that the same God who right now is keeping the sun, moon, and stars in the right places is the same God who hopefully is going to keep that paint on the wall. God's doing all of that, and it does not tire him in the least. Do not think that God has a certain amount of yeses he's going to give you, and you, you can't burn them up too quickly. No. God, God is, he, he invites you to ask. 
He says, knock, keep on. He, he talked the one parable, he says, you know, if you keep asking enough, you're going to get an answer, not even because you, you want to get it, because he wants to answer it, just to shut you up. Do you pray like that? Do you, do you just knock and knock and knock and say, God, eventually you're going to say yes, or eventually I'm going to die, but I'm going to keep praying and praying. I'd say many of us don't, because we just, I don't think we think God's that sovereign. I don't think we recognize that he's that much in control, that he really can do all of that, and it does not tire him out. Now, maybe you're asking, how could, why would God care that much? Why would God care how my paint looks on the wall? Why would God care about my skin knee, my, my pet's foot? Why, why would he care that much? Well, God loves us, and he shows us at the cross how much he cares for us. He loves us so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross for us. And I want you to hear that. God loved the world so much. Loved the world. See, sometimes what we do is we say God hated the world. He hated sin so much he killed his only son. That's not, that's not John 3.16. No, God loved the world so much that he sends his only son. So that at the cross, all of, of God's anger and wrath to sin can be poured out. And then he raises his son from the dead as proof for us that God no longer has wrath towards us. For those that are in Christ Jesus, we, we can pray, and God's not looking to say no. Like, do you believe that? Like, God wants to say yes to prayers? We know that God won't say yes to every prayer. I'm not saying that. But your general posture to prayer, do you think that God loves you and wants to say yes to things? Especially the things that you pray in God's will. Like, here's the, the biggest one. This is a prayer I, I think everyone should be praying every day. Do you pray not only for repentance, but for a heart that loves God? To say, God, I, I want to be a man, I want to be a woman after your own heart. And, and I want to say, do you think God will answer that prayer? Do you think that God will, will, will make you a man or woman after his own heart? And what I'd say is if he won't answer that prayer, he wouldn't answer any prayer. What kind of prayer, what, what, what else would he want than for that prayer request to be brought before him? God, I don't love you enough. I'm sorry about that. I want to love you more. Would you help me with that? You can be sure that's a yes and amen prayer, that God will answer that. And then, and then as we just live in God's will and we just say, okay, God, I'm doing this. I'm living in your will. Would you help me to, to, to continue to live in your will? You're going to find more and more yeses. Like, for example, if you, you feel like, hey, I've been studying the word, I've been trying to do this, and I have this chance to share the gospel at work. Do you think that God, if you pray and say, God, I'd like, to, I'd like for some courage here to, to, to pray and, and, and to share the gospel, do you think God would say no to that? Like, no. He wants to say yes to this. The issue here is, is as James says, he says, you don't have because you don't ask. But then he follows it up, and when you do ask, you ask wrongly to spend it on your selfish desires. See, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, maybe the reason we're getting no is because we're not praying in God's will. Maybe we're, we're asking for, you know, hey, I want this big, big new house. I want a big, fancy new car, and God's saying no to that. But if we said, God, I'd, I'd really love it if you could, you could help just keep my car together for another, another six months. He'll pray. I think he'll, hopefully he'll say yes to that. I, I think that sometimes we're not asking ourselves before we pray, is this God's will? We're just saying, God, look, here's what I'm going to do. I hope that you sprinkle some dust on it and make it work, but if not, I'm going to try anyway. And that kind of posture shows a self-reliance in your heart. So, so what I want to just say is, as a people, how do we pray? Do we pray prayers that show we believe in God's sovereignty that God is the one that's right now working and willing to bring all things, uh, it, it, uh, all things for good for those that love him? Or do we pray in such a way that he's like a break in case of emergency? God, I haven't asked for anything in a while, so I, I really I need you to come through this one. I, that's not God. God is sovereign. God can answer prayer. And for Jonah, he, he learns that God can do that. Uh, he learns that God's sovereign, but he does not have a heart change for him. We see that. We see Jonah 3, he, he does go and preach to the city, but, but by Jonah 4, he's angry that the city repents. He, he doesn't have this moment where he really just has this ultimate heart change. And what I want to say today is if you're far from God, you feel like you, maybe you're in your own Sheol, 
you feel like I'm spiritually dead, I'm spiritually far from God, I want to invite you to call out to Jesus. Because even if you're as unlovable and unlikable as Jonah, when Jonah calls out, God answers. He answers all the way. He'll reach down from heaven through earth down to Sheol to save. Because God's a God who loves. God's a God of grace and mercy. And that same God is alive and active today. He wants to save. And so I just invite you just to consider for a moment, where are you at with the Lord? And then call out to him. Say, God, I, I, I'm far from you. I feel, like, I feel like I got seaweed wrapped around my head. I feel like I'm so lost right now. I feel like you're so far away. But God, would you please come close? Would you come drag me out of the pit? He'll answer that prayer. He'll draw you nearer to himself. He promises it. So call out to him this morning. Would you stand with me? Let's, let's pray. God, we thank you that you have given us such a, a privilege to pray. The fact that right now we get to, in the Spirit, stand where angels fear to tread. And Lord, we get to ask you. We get to talk to you. And Lord, we confess our sins. We recognize, Lord, that this is not where we should be. This should be a fearful and terrible thing. And yet, Lord, you have justified us. You have saved us. You have sanctified us. And you've now called us to stand here and to pray. And with every prayer we pray, we recognize you are sovereign. Lord, that's why we pray over offering. We pray over worship. We pray over the word. Lord, we pray over everything in our lives. Because everything, Lord, is, is from you, is through you, and to you. And Lord, we just, we just bring it all to you this morning. We give our whole lives to you and just say, God, have it all. And Jesus, have your way. Lord, I pray that if there's people here that are far from you, whether they're unbelievers or maybe believers, that they feel like they're just in their own personal sheol right now. Father, I pray that you would reach down. Just draw us near. Give us a big hug, Lord. We want to be near you. We want to, we want to love you more as a church. We recognize that we don't always love you, and we're sorry for that. We repent of that, and we want, we want to be empowered by your Spirit to do that. So, Father, give us your Spirit. Enable us. Empower us. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when i cannot stand i'll fall on you jesus you're my hope and stay and when i cannot stand i'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. we come to the part of our service where we just take a moment, just recognize uh, all that the Lord has done for us and, and to show us how, to remind us of how he's shown his love to us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That, that, that word appointed actually happens uh, in Acts 2 when they're talking about, uh, talking about this moment. That just as the Lord appointed a great fish to come and swallow Jonah, the Lord from eternity past appointed this moment. This moment at the cross where the Son of God, who's perfect and sinless, was to be slaughtered on our behalf, to be crucified, to be punished for our sins so that through him we might have forgiveness, through his resurrection we might partake in his life. And we remember that at the Lord's Supper. Uh, we, we don't, you don't have to be a member to partake of this, but you do have to be a Christian. And so uh, we're going to read the Apostles' Creed together as a church. Um, and this is just a statement of, this is just a simple uh, confession of faith. So we just ask you to read this together with us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, the, Lord, uh, the, the Apostle Paul tells us, and I'll, I'll read here, uh, let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bre- uh, in this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. And so he's inviting us before we partake of this meal just to reflect in our heart and soul and just have a moment where we recognize, is there something in my life, a sin or some type of disobedience that I just need to confess and lay down so that I can rightfully partake of this meal. So I'm just going to give you just just a a moment of, of quiet just to talk to the Lord yourself.
Lord, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Lord, we recognize that like Jonah, we have resisted your call a hundred times over, Lord. There's been opportunities you've given us, and we've said no. Chances to share the gospel that we've run away from. Opportunities to live a holy, pleasing life that, again, we just, we just run from, God. And here at this moment, we just, we just stand before you and confess our sin. We confess that we have sinned. We want to repent of our sin, and we want your Holy Spirit to empower that repentance. That it wouldn't just be, I'm sorry, but, but that, God, you would give us the grace that we need to live holy and pleasing lives. That we might not offend your, your good and holy laws. So, Father, we just pray for forgiveness and we pray for the, the power of the Holy Spirit. To just, just help us, just, just sanctify us, oh God. We want to be closer and closer with you every day. We want to fall more and more in love with you and worshiping you. Because as we do that, Lord, we know that it, it all just, just, it just makes sense. And it just unlocks, Lord. God, your, your burden is easy. Your yoke is light. And Father, we want to just take that on this morning. We want to just take the name of Jesus on. And we do that through eating this meal and partaking of this meal together as one body, as one church. Father, I pray that you would bless this meal to our bodies and to our souls. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk worthy of the name that we carry as Christians. I pray this in Jesus' most precious name. And all God's people said, amen. Ushers can come forward here. Some of you may know uh, when Jesus was first coming, as he was walking the earth, uh, some of the Pharisees and Sadducees, they demanded a sign from him. And he said, the only sign that will be given to this generation is the sign of Jonah. Uh, and he said, just as, jo just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale or belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Um, Jesus does that for us. He steps into our place, in our sin, into our shame, into the death that we deserve. He does that. He's substituting himself in our place. So I said, Jesus is sinless and perfect. He's the God of life. He was there from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, Jesus was there. All things exist 
by him, through him, and for him. He holds all things together by the power of his word. And yet Jesus, who is life itself, became death for us. In his body, he took all the sins of the world in his flesh so that they might be crucified with him. So Jesus, I want to just explain, as I said earlier, you might feel like you're in your own Sheol. You might feel far from God. You might feel like you got this death, you got seaweed wrapped around your head. And I want to say, Jesus has come for you. He's come to be right where you're at. He's meeting you right where you are right now. You don't have to be at the bottom of the ocean to be, feel like you're, you're, you're at the bottom of the ocean in life. And right now, God's calling you. He, he's, he's drawing drawing you to himself. And he's already stood in your place and received your condemnation at the cross. And we're reminded of this when we partake of this meal. When when we think of the body of Jesus Christ that soaked up the sins of this world and was crucified at the cross. And here's what Jesus said about about this meal. He said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together, church. And you think about the fact that Jesus not only reached down from heaven, but that he came in the form of, of man, that he became incarnate, that he became, he, he knows everything that it's like to be human. He's gotten sleepy, he's been, you know, he, he's been hungry, all of that, so that he might be able to say, I've been in your shoes, I've stood in your place for you. But not only did he become a human, but he has a heart that, that beat blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And the only way that we can be released from Sheol, the only way we could ever defeat death is not because of our life and our good deeds. It's because of Jesus' life, Jesus' good deeds, because of who he is. And he imputes that to us by the blood of Jesus, by his own blood. He, he sprinkles us. He, he he says, you're, you're mine. And now when God looks at us, he looks at us through the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. Do you, do you understand when you pray? He's not seeing a dirty sinner that he, he despises. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And we're made to be brought into union with Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and this is the promise that he makes in the new covenant. And Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, let's drink this together. Heavenly Father, it's it's so hard to think just how much you love us, how big your heart is, O God. While we were yet sinners, you saved us, you loved us, you bought us, When we hated you, when we didn't know you, you foreknew us and loved us. Lord, we praise you. And Lord, it's so hard at times, as I've struggled to make sense of Jonah and how unlovable and unlikable he is, and yet you saved him. It all makes sense when I look at my own life. And I think about how unlikable and unlovable I can be, and yet you saved me. God, thank you. Thank you that you love to save sinners. Amen. My friends, let's stand and sing together our our final song of praise, Amazing Grace.
His grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing amazing graces that we have uh, as New Testament believers is uh, to be able to pray for healing. And so after your service, if you have a physical ailment, I just want to invite you to come down here and love to anoint you with oil and pray for you. But uh, having said that, I just challenge you guys, as we go out in the world today, as the rest of the week comes and billows and breakers just wash over you, just to look to the Lord and pray big and bold prayers, to trust that God is for you. He proved that at the cross, to, to just Ask yourself, what's God's will? And then just do it. Go. Chase after him. He's calling you. So having said that, I want to send you out now in the grace of God the Father, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Go make disciples. You're dismissed. Amen.
Ashley. Thank you. 